good evening, little family. On this midweek, Wednesday, in the cool of the night, as we're going to go to sleep in a couple hours, we anticipate that death, sleep, and rising to newness of life in the morning. That's what our Lord, Maker, Creator gives us sleeping and waking up for little images of resurrection. And He became incarnate in the flesh, Christmas, so that He could die. And He rose again. That's the main reason for the season, as we're going to say. Um, but as we contemplate this night and this time, this quiet time, we worship with Advent Vespers. And the theme for these midweek services will be based on hymnody. The cover of the little insert bulletin there tells you which hymn it will be. It will be the office hymn of the night. And I will preach basically around that theme of that hymn. So as we quiet down, I'd like to say, uh, go ahead and take a deep breath and get into the feeling of Advent and the whole candle that we just lit on Sunday. And uh, know that we are at peace with God through all things. We begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, open my lips. The psalm for tonight is Psalm 16 that we will chant responsibly. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. chosen portion and my cup, you hold my lot. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices, my flesh also dwells secure. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Our first reading for tonight is from Isaiah, the second chapter. It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall decide disputes for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The epistle is written in the fifth chapter of Romans. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, 
knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Our third reading is written in the Gospel of John, the first chapter. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Continue with the Advent responsory to the reading. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. This is the name by which he will be turn to our office hymn of the night. It is hymn number 334, O Lord, How Shall I Meet You?
love the Lord's appearing, O glorious sun now come, send forth your beams so cheering and guide us safely home. In the name of Jesus, amen. Sermons for this midweek services over the next four weeks of Advent are going to be based on our office hymns for the night. And for this Vesper service, it is, O Lord, how shall I meet you? The great Lutheran hymn writer Paul Gerhardt wrote the text to this hymn, and Johann Kruger composed the tune. Kruger first published this in 1653 in his hymn compilations under the heading on the incarnation of Jesus Christ. It was the well-known hymn translator, though, Catherine Winkworth, who in 1863 translated it into English in her chorale book for England. At its core, the text is about sin, forgiveness, and Christ's incarnation as a necessity for the salvation of sinners. Stanzas 1 through 4 are addressed to Christ, with singers engaging in a personal reflection in the first person singular. Stanza 2 recalls Christ's Palm Sunday entrance into Jerusalem, the text we have for the Advent 1 Gospel this past Sunday. Stanzas 3 and 4 are the heart of Gerhardt's hymn. Three contrasts the sinner's bondage and shame with the freedom and honor given because God's Son was willing to become incarnate for sinners. In stanza four, it is entirely a matter of his love, a word repeated five times in this stanza, for our lost and fallen race, and of his thirst for my salvation. Now, stanza five is a gem of pure gospel proclamation. Christ's first coming was for the purpose of procuring the peace of sin forgiven. Stanza 6, it points singers to Christ's second coming to judge the nations, a terror to his enemies who reject him. They reject him in unbelief, but to those who love his appearing, a light of consolations and the blessed hope that will guidely bring us home, guide us safely home. It's about the consequences for all who believe, and it is to be a joy in the coming second advent. Gerhardt and his hymn are theological. The Lutheran service book contains 17 of his hymns. In the German hymn books, he has 30 hymns, outnumbered in those German hymn books only by Martin Luther. In the beginning of the 17th century, the manifold territories of the Holy Roman Empire in Germany continued to be plagued by confessional conflicts. Gerhardt's mother's family had experienced banishment from house and home as his grandfather, Pastor Kaspar, Starkey of Eilenburg, held steadfast to the Book of Concord in the face of the political pressures imposed by the vacillating confessional alliances of territorial rulers. That's a lot of words there, you see, but I bet you didn't realize or know how precious or how it is that we hold and cling to our confessional documents of this Lutheran confessional church we are in. They were considered much more important and of value than many people see them today. Gerhardt was labeled one of the most faithful confessional guys and pastors in his lifetime back then. And it appears that his poetic skills that were awakened at the Royal Grimma Academy in Saxony would inform him his hymnody as he read Latin classical poetry and studied hymns and songs that had been composed on the basis of biblical and especially Old Testament texts. He lived during the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648, and in it his homeland, family, home, church, and entire village would not be spared. He then left for Berlin. It was there that he befriended, befriended Kruger, who was the cantor of St. Nikolai Church and music teacher of the school at the Gray Monastery in Berlin. Kruger immediately took to Gerhardt's poetry and put his text to music. Upon Kruger's death, the special quality and character of Gerhardt's hymns was to be recognized in the publication of an exclusive volume of more than 100 of his hymns composed by Kruger's successor at Berlin, who was Johann Gerhard Ebling. Gerhard remained a faithful pastor in Lubin until his death on May 27, 1676. Gerhard survived the death of his wife and four out of his five children shortly before that. And the Lutheran Church commemorates him on October 26 as a faithful pastor who steadfastly confessed his faith in word and deed. Our hymns have history, 
They are doctrinal and therefore theological masterpieces. The Lutheran confessional forefathers would say, when you sing a hymn, you are preaching. In fact, this is one of the reasons the early, early church from the second to third centuries onward always would sing the entire order of worship in their Sunday gatherings, the readings of the day and all. And that is because music lifts the liturgy to a whole new level. If the angels and saints are constantly singing in heaven, then why shouldn't we mimic their methods in the throne room of God that they have there? I remember when I was in seminary, two required courses to graduate were Liturgics I and Liturgics II. In Liturgics II, we were required to pick hymns from the Lutheran service book and research them, write a paper about the doctrine and theology found in the text, and link it to a sermon even. Kind of like what I'm doing here tonight. When you sit down to do that, you will be amazed at the insight given through 400-year-old hymn texts like these. They are not like modern evangelicals, hip-hop, contemporary Christian music. No, they can't be compared to them, oftentimes with the incessant repeating of one word or chorus that those contemporary songs have just over and over again. They're not like that. I guess they lack the aptitude for understanding theology, doctrine, and just what a worship song is supposed to be and what it's supposed to do and especially who it is aimed at. We say that our hymns are preacher's words because they point to Christ and not to ourselves. As the Bible is not primarily about ourselves, neither should worship music be. We must preach Christ, his work, and sing of him. Ultimately, all heavenly music finds its place in him, and he ultimately is the master conductor of the symphony of creation. In Genesis 1-3, God made an address to the nothing that he then created into the heavens and the earth. God uttered sound, thought. His divine vibrations went forth, and there was light, waters, land, plants, trees, vegetation, planets, and stars, living creatures, birds, and every creature that was moving along the earth and in the sea. Then God made man in his own image. It was quite the sermon those six days that carried along. But we know the consequence of what happened with man because of the fall and the ejection out of the garden. Man no longer could meet with God. And so that turns us back to our hymn, O Lord, how shall I meet you? How do we welcome you? My heart's desire is to get to delight in and with you once again, to have your lamp within my breast. I lay in fetters groaning. I stood my shame bemoaning. O oh Lord, how shall I, I, a poor miserable sinner, be able to meet you? Sin's death the fearful burden, though cannot his love erase. Love caused his incarnation. Love brought him back down to me. And there it is. That is the answer to how shall I meet you? Christ thirsts for my salvation. Love beyond all telling. He came to pardon. He came to enact peace. To be peace himself. And he was born to die. And that was the only way God could secure his children eternal life once again. He banned Adam and Eve from the garden. Lest they eat of the tree of life. And then they would have been lost in sin forever. He placed angel guards at the entrances and hid that mountain paradise until, as our gospel text for this evening told us, the light shone in the darkness. In the beginning was the word. In the beginning, that is to say, in the Genesis, was the song of songs. It is him who made all things, and his life was the light of men. His life. O Lord, how shall I meet you? Alive, that's how. Born to die, was buried, and on the third day arose from the dark grave, procuring for you a glorious crown, a treasure safe on high. And this treasure is how, here and now, he guides us home, back to Eden, back to partake of the tree of life, sins forgiven forever. As the psalm we sung this evening promises, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Yes, this week's Advent 1 in Luke 21 that we are still in the week of, spoke of the shaking. But Christ came down in the flesh, born of the virgin, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and then died in swaddling cloths to remove the shaking from your lives on the last day. 
a terror to his foes, but a light of consolations and blessed hope to those who love the Lord's appearing. O Lord, how shall I meet you is not a fearful question to ask. It is to say, come, Lord, give me the directions. I want to punch them into my GPS on whatever you say you will be. Please tell me that, Lord. I want to know where the spot is. Lord, console me with your holy address. Send forth your beams so cheery. And to that, the Lord answers and the Lord addresses us back. In the Old Testament reading in Isaiah, Isaiah foretold that already. Where shall we meet him? When he says, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord, and that's the address in our home, where the nation shall flow to it. Many people saying, and I say singing, let us go up to the mountain of our Lord. And then tonight I'll close with the epistle reading from Romans because it does tie into the office hymn of today. Therefore, we have been justified by faith and we now have peace with God through Jesus Christ. The peace of sin forgiven and stands a five. Through him we have obtained access, access to the meeting place. And his meeting place is where we stand by grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. So now what? We rejoice in our sufferings. What? Rejoice in suffering? Yeah, because it is how the children of God endure, receive back his image and hope. This week's Advent candle meaning ties into that as well. It is the hope candle. See, we must tie and connect all things together in this season of Advent. It is to be how you live all seven days of the week. You have been given these things, so that you can live. And while you live, yes, anticipate how shall you meet him. Those thoughts alone are enough to distract your earthly mind and ways from the snares of sin and death. His love and his ways cover all of that. I like to refer to such grace as our heavenly security blanket to cover up with during our waiting years. And this blanket Linus's has nothing on, especially during Christmas time because we cover ourselves with his incarnation as he has covered himself with our flesh. And he did that so that we can meet him. So let us magnify the Lord as we are about to do in the Song of Mary, singing, singing about salvation, bring down his grace and mercy. He may have ascended on high, but when you call, he loves to come down. And not that Jesus doesn't have good hearing, but right now heaven is pretty far away. So sing when you call to him. Make the angels jealous. The world and all the nations shall not cover our praises because we know how to meet him, where he brings heaven down to earth. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall declare your praise. King who comes to save us. Yes, meet us, O Lord. Meet us this night. In the name of Jesus, amen.
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, and let my cry come to you. Stir up your power, O Lord, and come, that by your protection we may be rescued from the threatening perils of our sins and saved by your mighty deliverance. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Direct us, O Lord, in all our doings with your most gracious favor and further us with your continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended, in you we may glorify your holy name, and finally, by your mercy, obtain eternal salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Holy Spirit. 